G'day there, you're watching the Aussie BIM Guru. Today I've got a tutorial where we're dealing with resampling surfaces in Rhino. So in this case I've taken some rooms from Revit using Rhino Inside in a previous tutorial which I highly recommend you watch if you haven't already because I'll be using the output of that in this study. Now sometimes when you generate surfaces from other formats or programs or just BREPs in general, they may not be sampled by proprietary tools in the way you expect. In this case, my goal is to bring this into Ladybug and I'm going to want to sample this on a meter by meter basis. I want to have a predictable sampling. Now I'm going to show you pretty early on in this tutorial that that's not actually going to be the case. We need to be so careful that we know how our programs function because otherwise we could create misleading results with some heavily skewed results or bias depending on how clustered our, our sampling is. So in this case, I'm going to show you a way that you can reconstruct these surfaces into meshes with joined faces that will force them to be sampled in a very predictable way. So I'm going to be using in this case Rhino 7, I'm not going to be using Rhino inside so you don't need to run this out of Revit, you'll just need some surfaces to resample. And along the way I'll teach you some really handy techniques such as forcing surfaces to always point up and also just how to resample surfaces into predictable UV domains. Anyway, let's get started. Okay, uh, so let's dive in. So we're gonna begin with a large object meters template. Uh, the reason I'm doing this is because Ladybug I found typically works best when dealing with meters instead of millimeters. I'm gonna import in uh, the room boundaries that I generated in a previous tutorial. Um, so in this case, these are gonna be all BREPs um, that contain some information from Elefront. And we're gonna reconstruct these into analysis meshes. Um, the reason we're gonna do this is because the way that they're gonna be sampled by Ladybug isn't ideal. And I'll show you how you can sort of check how Ladybug's going to do this. So select all the BREPs and we're going to generate test points. And in this case, we'll just use a Ladybug generate point grid component from the Ladybug package. I'm going to feed in my geometry and I'm just going to connect this to one for the grid size and one for the offset distance. And check out the way that these surfaces are being broken down, especially around corners. Um, it's very unideal how these are being managed. And this isn't really a fault of Ladybug. Um, because Ladybug is turning these into meshes and doing its best to essentially build these into something that has an analysis grid. Um, but I have found that if you can force your meshes into a very regular mesh already um, with a predefined grid, you can essentially force Ladybug to sample only the points you want it to. So I'm going to show you in this tutorial how you can force essentially your analysis grids to be exactly what you want. In this case, a one by one meter grid on average across all the rooms. Um, so in this case, let's just make a fresh script. So we're going to begin by using Elefront to reference um, all of our geometry by layer. So in Elefront, we're going to go reference by layer. And I'm going to reference the rooms layer in this case. And immediately that just collects all my geometry for me. So I don't have to go and select it every single time. Now sometimes um, a common problem that you might run into is that the normals might not be facing the right direction. Usually with Revit, they should all point up. But some programs, maybe they won't. So let's um, let's go and flip a few elements. So I'm just going to type in flip. And I'm just going to force a couple of these to have the wrong normal direction. Because this is a really useful little trick um, that I use for lots of things. But in this case, we want to check which surfaces normals are pointing down. So below zero for their Z component. So in this case, I'm going to evaluate surface. And because we know we're dealing with essentially untrimmed surfaces here, we can evaluate these surfaces and we can just build a point. So in this case, construct point. It doesn't really matter where we construct it. Um, in this case, I'm just going to construct it at zero, zero, zero. And I'm just going to re-parameterize my surfaces so that it's within the, the domain of the surface itself. And I'm just going to turn off my previews. Now, what we should get now is a normal. So in this case, let's just have a look at the normals that we're looking at. So it looks like they're all pointing up, pointing up, pointing up. Let's just recompute so that those surfaces we flipped are considered and oh no, here we go. Some surfaces are pointing down. So when we analyze them in Ladybug, they're gonna get pushed in the wrong direction. So we need to flip these. So one way you can flip is you can just use the flip command, but the problem is this flips all the surfaces. So in this case, we need to mix and match depending on the vector's outcome. Now there's a lot of ways to do this, but the, the most direct way I've found is using a little bit of list management. So I'm gonna merge these two lists together and I'm just gonna essentially do a lazy man's entwine by grafting the two lists together. And this will build 
sublists containing the, the surface and its flipped version in that order on branches of a tree, essentially. So it's a little bit of a lazy method. I know it's probably not the most computationally efficient method, um, but it's the one that I just typically use for most studies. I'm then gonna deconstruct uh, the vector. So in this case, I'm gonna deconstruct this vector to get its Z value. And I'm gonna be checking uh, when this is less than zero. Because in this case, um, obviously it's a problem. So we're gonna say, is it less than zero? And if, if it is, um, I'm just gonna show you what happens to Booleans when you turn them into numbers, because I'm gonna take advantage of this and sort of abuse this, because you can see that the Boolean is true and false, but if we turn this to a number, true is one and false is zero. So I'm gonna use this to index the branches of my tree. A little bit sneaky, um, but a little fun trick that I like to use sometimes. So I'm gonna call on list items and from my entwined branches, I'm gonna call on these indices. And at this point, we should now be able to see if we just graph our indices onto our tree and flatten our output, that we'll get one or the other out of these flipped or non-flipped surfaces. And what I might just do is copy this uh, evaluate surface, just so I can have a look at what's come out the other end of this node. And I'll just get a panel and check the vectors. And there we go. We can see now our vectors are always pointing up. So that's really important. Um, that's a really handy little script um, just in general for flipping normals. I might just actually group off this little portion of the script. So we're now gonna move on to the next bit, which is essentially trying to bound our surfaces um, in order to assess the U and the V sampling that we're gonna need to apply to get as close as possible to an even uh, cell grid. Um, I might just save my script in case I crash, but I shouldn't, ideally. Um, but in this case, I'm gonna take a bounding box around each of these. Now, the challenge here is I found sometimes the bounding box is a flat box and sometimes it's a box. So this doesn't actually work for us. We want these to always be a flat box or essentially a surface. So I sort of use a little bit of a trick here. I deconstruct these B-reps and I also take their area and this is just to get essentially the size of each face because some of these are gonna be boxes uh, essentially with six faces. Um, and this is, a, you know, obviously a problem. I'm then gonna sort these lists. Um, so I'm gonna sort this. And I'm also gonna sort this as well. So I'm gonna sort all the faces by their area. And then I'm just gonna index uh, the last, the last, um, the last face essentially with the largest area. So from my original faces, I'm gonna go and call on the index not the index, sorry, the the, um, the area, sorry, just I've modeled myself up here. I'm doing this wrong. I need to take each face and I need to call on the index of negative one. So the last item of each sorted list. And this should essentially be the largest face that we're dealing with in each case. So we should have one item per bounding box. And from this, I bound it again. So I make it a bounding box. And this time I found typically all the bounding boxes will now be a flat box um, with one face essentially. So it's a really strange little step, this one, but I've just found that this is this is pretty much the best way to manage out um, those boxes that essentially what we want to be flat boxes in this case. So that's the next step. So we have our bounding boxes, well, our flat boxes, and this is what we're gonna use to lay a grid across our rooms. And then we're gonna intersect that against our room B reps. But now I'm gonna take the edges of, uh, in this case, those B reps. And these are gonna come out in a particular order that's always consistent. So in this case, I can analyze these by calling on list item. And I'm gonna be trying to look for one of the horizontal edges and one of the edges going into the, the other direction, the Y, the Y direction. And I'm gonna use these to assess the U and the V components that I should be applying to a panelization of each of these. So I'm gonna take these edges. And in this case, first thing I'm gonna call on index zero. And we can see that's gonna be the horizontal edge of this bounding box. And then also you're gonna take one at index one. And I can see that this one is gonna be running into the Y axis instead. So we can now assess these against a spacing. So I'm gonna take the length of these curves. And I'm also just gonna flatten these as well. Just so we end up with, with 30 numbers and 30 numbers. And I'm gonna divide each of these by a common spacing. So at this point in the script, I usually like to create 
a value list just to add a couple of common values that you might want. So in this case, I'm going to do point, 0 0.5, 1, and 2. And by default, I'm just going to set it to 1. So I'm going to divide these by 1, which obviously is going to be the same number, but this gives us the option to resample that division. And from here, I'm just going to round both of them off to the nearest interval um, that satisfies that, that spacing. So this is essentially where we can assess what the U and the V count of a sampling of these surfaces should be. So in this case, I'm also now going to use lunchbox and I'm going to use this to create quad panels. So the quad panels in this case are going to be applied to the, the flat boxes. And I'm going to be using the domains that I've now ascertained above. So I'm going to just take these rounded values and now we can see that I'm getting a fairly uniform grid across each of these. So I'm just in this case going to go and just turn off some of this preview geometry. But there we go. We can see now this is looking very even. Now the only problem is that obviously we have samples falling outside the actual surface itself, um, which you know, obviously we don't want. Um, I can see now I can also change the size of my sampling grid. But now we need to find all the faces that occur within our actual analysis surfaces or our rooms. And then we're going to reconstruct these into meshes. So in this case, um, we're gonna have to find out essentially what's going on with these at this point. So I've got my quad surfaces. And in this case, um, I'm also just gonna go and find the, the plane at each of these surfaces. So to the bounding boxes, I'm also gonna take their, their area. And this is just so I can get their centroid, which I know sits at the plane that these exist on. And they're gonna do a rectangle two point and in this case, I'm going to, I'm going to probably, actually, I might take the Q grid, the quad grid instead. I do prefer quad grid in this case, probably. Hmm, actually, maybe panels might be okay. Now, this might be all right. I might be able to work with this instead. Sorry, I was just, um, I just made a mistake in this case. I probably don't need to do this. I realized that my base script is actually more inefficient. Um, so I can probably actually, in this case, probably just take these against the B reps that, the, that they generated from. So I'm going to use a B rep closest point. And I should be able to hopefully just take the centroid of these panels. So I'll just apply an area node to the panels. And this will give me the, the point at the center of each one. And I'll just turn off the preview for my quad panels for now. I'm going to take these center points and I'm going to check how far they are from the respective B rep that they originally came from. So back here when we still have the surfaces and any that aren't within the actual surface are obviously going to be have to be pulled towards the surface. They're not going to be able to be at the surface, whereas other points will exist on the surface itself. So from this, we can assess which ones are closer than a certain distance. I'm going to say which ones are less than maybe 0.5 from the surface. So we're going to apply a little bit of tolerance to these, um, as you'd expect. And I think I also might need to graph this result in this case, so that we're dealing with the points respectively for each surface. I think that's necessary. I'll just double check. Yeah, there we go. Now we can see those points are being forced onto each surface that they relate to. And now I can see that I'll have some that will be true, some that will be false, depending on whether they've had to move in order to reach the surface they originally came from. Now, if they're true, I want to keep them. So I'm going to run a cull pattern. And to my original cells, I'm going to apply my cull pattern. So now I'll just turn off a few of these. And there we go, perfect. We can see that now we're culling based on this tolerance. So I can obviously maybe, I might make a slider um, and I'll, I'll go between 0, 0.5 and 1. Whoops, 0, 0.5 and 1. And as I change this tolerance, you'll see that the surface samples will become sort of more restricted than others. So maybe I'll work with 0.1, that looks pretty good. So this is taking only the patches that fall within each surface and they're still structured with the sublists at the same level as the B reps, which is really important. So at that point, I can also group this off. And now we're really just reconstructing these into meshes and applying the same data we built in Elefront before to rebake them with the same intelligent data. So I'm gonna make a mesh. And I'm also gonna to have to mesh join these meshes together. So this is gonna work across each list so it should lead with, uh, it, it will lead to me having essentially a mesh for each B wrapper I originally had. So our data's went on quite a journey um, to get to where it is now. 
But the important thing is we also need to move across this Elefront data from before. So in this case, um, I'll just find one of these objects with some data in it. There we go. So we do need to move across area, ID, name, and number. So in this case, we are gonna rebake these using Elefront. So I'm gonna build some attributes. I might just go to the Elefront tab. It's easier to find things that way. And we're gonna define some object attributes. And in this case, I'm just gonna manually call on my keys, ID, and I'll make this a multi-line. So we'll call on ID, name, number, and area. So these are the four keys that we need. And I'm also just going to get the user values as well. So this will let me retrieve the original values from these elements. Now I believe in this case, I actually need to do it by key. So I need to get user value. There we go. So I'm gonna go back to my original referenced BREPs and I'm gonna retrieve the elements based on these keys. And this should give me values from the original elements that I can now pass across to my new geometry I'm about to bake in. I can also, in this case, take uh, my Rhino attributes, which will give me the names of those elements as well. So now we have those IDs that we can just rebake. So I'm gonna construct some attributes from this. I'm gonna construct my name and I'm gonna graft everything based on this. I'm then gonna take uh, my keys and my values. And we should now have uh, Elefront attributes ready to be rebaked. Now I'm gonna bake these to a new layer. I'm gonna call this analysis rooms. And in this case, I'm gonna put these on this layer. And I'm also gonna bake these into the model. And I'm gonna name the bake name after that as well. So for the attributes, I'll take my Elefront attributes. And for my geometry, I'm gonna take these meshes instead. I'm then gonna get a button, and this will be my, my baking button. And now if I bake, we should have both analysis rooms and rooms. So if I turn off my rooms, now we can see we have these joined meshes, and this one still has all the properties from what we passed across before. Now let's go and run this through the ladybug test points tool now just to see what happened, um, I guess, in this case, uh, based on this new analysis. So I'm gonna save this, I'm gonna close these scripts, and I'm just gonna have a look at these on their own. So I'll just make sure that I've turned off my rooms, which I have. Recompute, and I'm just gonna go and collect these, these uh, meshes instead, actually. So I'm gonna get my meshes. I'm going to feed in those meshes instead. And now we should see that our test points are incredibly uniform. Look at that. They're essentially matching the division of our mesh. Now, the only limitation here is that they're always going to match the mesh, match the mesh, <laughs> no matter what you set your spacing to. So if I say my sample spacing is, you know, 0.2, in this case, it's still going to match the cell division of the mesh. So you do need to pre-sample your surface in the mesh division that you want to test it at. So in my case, I wanted to test it on a meter by meter basis. But you can see now that the results are entirely uniform, which is really what you want for a lot of studies typically. So this is a really useful technique. It's got me out of hot water a lot of times. And I hope that this will help you also in creating more predictable and predefined studies in Ladybug. So there we go. Um, our B reps went on quite the journey there, didn't they? But now we have surfaces that are sampled really well and able to be used in a study very reliably. I use this technique all the time when I'm dealing with flat surfaces in Ladybug. And you'll see the results pretty soon in a future tutorial where I'll show you how to run a solar study across these surfaces and send the results back to Revit. I hope you find this useful and maybe you'll find other applications for this technique beyond just Ladybug as well. Anyway, if you're not already following and subscribing, uh, feel free to do so and I look forward to seeing you in future tutorials. Thanks, take care, bye.